Good evening. Uh, thank you all for, for coming. <coughs> uh, in my talk tonight, I'm going to talk about waste in the big picture, the arguments against incineration, the zero waste 2020 strategy, the key step forward, and uh, waste initiatives around the world, and maybe in question time, back to the big picture. The big picture, sustainability. <coughs> we would need four planets if everyone consumed like the average American. We would need two planets if everybody consumed like the average European. Uh, meanwhile, India and China are trying to consume at the same rate as we are, and something has to change. We're living on this planet as if we had another one to go to. Mr. Bush thought there was one. We hope he's <laughs> We cannot run a throwaway society on a finite planet. Waste is the evidence that we're doing something wrong. Landfills simply bury the evidence. Incinerators burn the evidence. We have to face the real problem. The real problem is fighting over consumption. Uh, not only <laughs> waste crisis, but it's giving us a global crisis. And that global crisis is our imposition of a linear society, a society that functions in straight lines, on a planet that functions in circles. So we're talking here about extraction of raw materials, production of manufactured items, consumption, discarded materials. It's a one-way street to waste. And we stimulate this consumption with advertising on television, over-advertising produces overconsumption. Now as far as the impacts are concerned, we use a lot of energy in extraction and shipping them halfway around the world, a lot of energy on manufacture, more transport, more transport, and in the process we produce at both stages solid waste, air pollution, water pollution, and carbon dioxide, and all this carbon dioxide is contributing to global warming. Now what do the different waste practices do to this picture? Landfills, nothing. Nothing. Doesn't change it. One iota. Incineration, nothing, doesn't change this picture at all. Uh, recycling does. Recycling cuts out the extraction of raw materials and shipping them halfway around the world. Uh, reuse of objects cuts out both extraction and manufacture. Composting cuts out a little bit, but more importantly, composting retains the carbon. That, if that went into an incinerator, all that wood would immediately go to carbon dioxide, contribute to global warming. But in the compost, it's sequestered in the soil. Uh, there was a study done in Europe which showed that a combination of recycling and composting is actually 46 times better than incineration generating electricity uh, as far as reducing global warming gases are concerned. And as for energy, oh, incineration then is not sustainable. It doesn't challenge our overconsumption of finite resources. And it sabotages genuine, um, genuine moves towards sustainability. Just as the Coventry incinerator has sabotaged recycling for years and years and years in this time. <laughs> the PR hype is that incinerators are a, a production of energy. In fact, they waste an enormous amount of energy. If you look at these common materials that are burnt, in an incinerator, here's the amount of energy that you would save if you recycle them. This is the embedded energy. This is the amount of energy you would get if you burnt the same amount in an incinerator. Take this stuff, PET plastic. 26 times more energy is saved by recycling this than burning this. So if you're interested in energy and conservation, incineration is an environmental crime. And it's the height of stupidity for governments to be subsidizing these operators. Incineration is a poor investment. Most of the money spent on incinerators goes into complicated material, ma machinery and leaves the country uh, or the community. It's not British companies that are building these incinerators. Incineration is one of the most expensive ways of generating electricity. Incineration creates very few jobs. In contrast, the money spent on the alternatives goes into jobs and stays in the community. The engineering could all be done locally. Uh, this is an incinerator in Italy, in Brescia. It costs 300 million euros to build. It's only produced 80 jobs, and they've now spent another 400 million euros in a tax system where citizens are continuing to pay for this. Not for the operation, it's called cheap say uh, tax. 
Now compare those 80 jobs with Nova Scotia, which resisted incineration. They've created a thousand jobs uh, collecting and handling the materials, and another 2,000 jobs in the industries using these secondary materials. Two, 3,000 jobs versus 80. Incineration makes handling waste very complicated and dangerous. Think of an incinerator as three boxes. <coughs> the first box is a furnace which converts hundreds, if not thousands of tons a day of trash into trillions of nanoparticles, tiny particles and gases. Therefore, you need a second box. You need a second box to try to capture all those nanoparticles and toxic gases and so on. And guess what? The second box costs more money than the first box. And then, when you successfully capture all this toxic crap, then you've got to find a third box in which to put this ash. And for, in an incinerator, for every four tons of waste that you burn, you get one ton of ash or more. And the, the gentleman from the, the council said, we want to make the solution local. But the ash, the fly ash, is being sent to Gloucestershire right now. And goodness knows where the bottom ash is going to go. Denmark, you know, is a beautiful, clean country. They have a wonderful solution for their ash. They send it all to Norway. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants this stuff. 90% uh, of the bottom ash, ash is the bottom ash that falls to the grapes. 10% is captured in the air pollution control. Very toxic stuff. Um, it's expensive to get rid of. Oh, I've been through this. Okay. I've got the joke out already. Let's carry on. <laughs> you still need a landfill for the toxic ash. Incinerators put out many highly toxic and persistent substances into the air. We're most concerned about toxic metals. Metals in equals metals out. They're elements that can't be destroyed. The best that can happen is if you capture them, then you've got them in the ash. The worst, they can go into the air. Uh, secondly, we generate thousands, literally thousands, of new compounds including the most toxic substances that we've ever been able to make in a chemical laboratory. These come out as nanoparticles. And now we get to one of the most monstrous situations. Nanoparticles is a really hot object, um, subject right now, but there's no regulation for nanoparticles anywhere in Europe. The regulation for, for particles is 10 microns. This might go down to 2.5 microns. But the things that we're concerned about, the nanoparticles, are like peas compared to cannonballs here. So you're totally reckless right now to go ahead with incineration until people have asked very, answered very serious questions <coughs> raised by Stefania Cormier in the June 2006 Environmental Health Perspectives article. She explained how nanoparticles were formed, she explained how toxic they were, explained the health effects, and explained that it's very difficult to capture them because they're so tiny. They travel long distances, they remain suspended for long periods of time, they can go deep down into the lungs, and this is the really most serious part of this whole business. It really shook me, is these nanoparticles are so tiny they go straight through the membranes. So you get them into the lung, they're straight into the blood, then they're distributed to every tissue in the body, they can enter every tissue in the body, including the brain, they can cross the blood-brain barrier, here's a particle in the brain, it contains lead, barium, chromium, iron, and silver. 